Well, hello and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. We are back on Jackson Highway down in the uh, the Shoals, and we are back to talk with David Hood. David Hood, of course, is probably the bassist that has created, uh, you know, some of the grooves and some of the soundtrack of of your life, playing on, you know, famous you know recordings with uh, Paul Simon and Rod Stewart and the. Uh, staple singers and uh, on and on and on and uh, aretha franklin and we uh johnny taylor <laughs> johnny taylor yeah. and so so many other acts and so we're we're uh we're just so happy that uh that david uh allowed us to invade that we're in the studio we're on the floor we're even in his position here that he was always at in the studio and so thank you david for doing this i'm happy to do it thank you all right, so one of the things I was most curious about was how does a trombone player become a bassist? Well, I started playing trombone in uh, high school, 10th grade, I think I started playing in the Sheffield High School band. And at the same time, I was a, a loved rock and roll and Bo Diddley and, and um, rhythm and blues, everything. I was a, a big music lover. And uh, I had friends, Jimmy Johnson and others who were playing in rock and roll bands. And I thought, man, that's what I want to do. I mean, the trombone is kind of, I mean, you do, you, you have to stand up because you hit people with the slide, but I, I love playing. Uh, I wanted the first guitar, but then the bass guitar, I saw immediately that there's not very many bass guitar players. And so yeah. I wanted to do that. And uh, I had, the first one I ever saw belonged to a guy named Edsel Rankard. And he played with Hollis Dixon and the Keynotes, probably the first rock band in town, uh, back way back when. And uh, I used to go up and stand, and I was one of those guys that stood in front of the band and watched. And I was watching Edsel. I thought, I, I can do that. And uh, so I bought a bass. I bought a Fender Jazz bass in 1961, and it was probably the first one in town because before that it was everybody was playing P basses. And uh, I just I picked it up pretty quickly. I, I bought the bass, I guess, when I was 18. And by age 22 or 23, I uh, played on some hit records. And it's just I was very fortunate to be, be working with my partners, Roger Hawkins, Jimmy Johnson, first Spooner, who I worked with yesterday, Spooner Oldham, and then later Barry Beckett, and uh, a, a number of great guitar players. and. Uh, we were fortunate to cut some great records with a lot of great artists. It's just I was at the right place at the right time. Yeah. And I, I think probably the key to my what I do is I keep it simple because I, I learned early on that what the bass does on records is not a very complicated thing. Uh, you have to keep it simple so that people know what you're doing. And, uh, and so that's what I do. Yeah. I never was a live player that much. I, first band was the Mystics. We played about four years, and then all my buddies in the band started graduating from, from college. And I thought, well, yes, I, I don't want to get a job. And, though I had a job, I was working at a tire store with my father. But yeah. I started playing uh, a lot in uh, 1966, was my first uh, Union scale recording session with Percy Sledge and Warm and Tender Love, and uh, it was a gold record. And so, when your first record is a gold record, then you people start calling, and so you have to learn how to play pretty quickly. And I did, and the rest is history. Yes. <laughs> so, were the first sessions that you played on bass or, or on trombone? Uh, bass. Okay. Uh, and I, yeah, bass was my first recording session. I later played uh, on, uh, they were, Aretha was recording at Fame. Right. And so I played trombone on that. I already knew how to play the trombone, more or less. And they didn't have enough 
you know, they, they, they probably didn't know another trombone player. Right. And uh, so I, I was fortunate to, to get to play on that, and it was a gold record. Yeah. And <laughs> it's just, when you're, when you're more successful than you ever thought about, right off the bat, you have yeah. to learn quickly to live up to whatever you've done. Yeah. And of course, it's been written about a lot that, that Rick, you know, kind of double and triple booked musicians so that he had, if someone wasn't performing, he'd just throw them out the door and he'd bring the next guy Yeah, in they line. didn't go out the door, but he had a couch at the back of the studio and you'd sit there. I'd sit there with Tommy Cogbill, I'd sit there with Jerry Jamont, I'd sit there with uh, Junior Lowe, whoever the other, the other players were, and you'd sit and Rick and I, somebody else, you know, and I, I think, Rick really didn't, Rick was a bass player himself and a pretty good musician, he was a yeah. fiddler. But he uh, he uh, he didn't really know what to tell people to do, so he just tried different people doing stuff. Okay. I had a, a, a so, someone that, uh, that played on a, a number of sessions there, you know, here and in Memphis and in Nashville, who said that Rick uh, would, he, he said that he was, that Rick, made some amazing records, but sometimes he would have so many takes of the same song over yes. and over again that it would just wear him out. And he enjoyed yeah. the finished product, but working for Rick was a little rough. Yeah, I think Rick was unsure of himself. He was, he was a, like I said, he was a, a musician before he ever got into recording. Uh, and it, but it, recording was still pretty new then, and uh, or making records around here. And uh, I think he would try different yeah musicians, see who came up with the best idea. Rick had a great ear and it was really a, a good ear for so songs, picking songs. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Junior Lowe was the main bass player with what would become the Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section. Uh, and But Junior was wanting to switch to guitar and I was ready to go. And so I right. just slipped right in. Kind of going back to the, the Aretha session, of course, much has been made about the uh, the uh, the conflict, you know, the the interaction between Ted White and and Rick. Was there any in, yeah, any vibe in, in the studio at the time all this was really, going down we, that there was going to be? I don't be... think any of the musicians really knew knew what was going on. I think Rick was at that time was drinking. Uh, Ted was drinking. Yeah. Uh, they there was some probably some issues between uh, Ted and Aretha. And, and you know, at that time, no, no, nobody knew who Aretha was. She wasn't right. the star that she became. Uh, she was just another lady singer. Really good, though. I remember the first time we heard her, all of us, we thought, wow. Mm -hmm. And it was because she 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 was a, an accomplished gospel singer. I think started probably at age 13 with her with her family. And, uh, when, and, and played piano as well. And so when we heard her sing and playing the piano at the same time, we were all just awestruck. Yeah. That was one thing that Jimmy mentioned in, in, in talking about Aretha was how important her piano playing was on the sessions. I, I really think it was key because before that, she had never really had that much success as an artist. But when, uh, I, I think it was Jerry Wexler that said play and sing at the same time. And it's something she'd been doing forever in, in her gospel life, but uh, Wexler said, sit down and play piano and sing. And that was really the key, because her, her phrasing vocally and piano all work together. You, uh, who are some of your influences as far as, I mean, again, it's, it's just such a, uh, an amazing story to all of a sudden be you're a recorded bass player, but who are some <laughs> who are some of the guys that you were listening to? Well, there who were the guys that you were copying? Yeah, there weren't really that many people playing. I mean, the bass was still a pretty new instrument, electric bass. Right. Uh, but uh, like I said, I, the, this fellow that played with Hans Dixon, he he had the same line for every song. It was do 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 do. I don't care what song, he played the same thing. But uh, I. I heard Tommy Cogbill and I was amazed. I mean, I thought, wow, how can anybody be that good? And uh, bass was a secret, second instrument to Tommy. He was right. a guitar player. Right. Uh, Doug Dunn is somebody I listened to and later became friends with. Of course, James Jamerson. It's all the same people that everybody else right. calls. Uh, uh, Paul McCartney, you know, the bass players in the rock bands I really liked, but it was the rhythm and blues players that I liked the best, I think. And 
luckily that was what we were doing mostly at first here. Yeah. Tommy Cogbill is not a, a, a name that's really known by a lot of bass players, unfortunately. Yeah, and that is really unfortunate because yeah. you could you can get a yeah. you could get a world of uh, lessons from Tommy. How would you describe Tommy's playing, or or, or like a, a, a handful of tunes? That... Gosh, I, I I don't really know. Yeah. But I, I mean, the first time I saw him play, I thought, gosh, I need to go find something else to do. Yeah. Uh, I guess it was at Fame, uh, one of the sessions. Rick would bring, Rick brought uh, Chips Moman down to play guitar on some sessions, yes. and Tommy was brought down as a guitar player, but switched over on bass in the middle of the session. I think it was a session that uh, Junior Lowe was playing on, and he was having trouble getting a part, and they got put Tommy on it, and he nailed it. Right. And uh, and Junior is a good player. Yeah. He was a good guitar player and a good bass player, and. Uh, he, not many people have even known or talked about Junior, right. but he was a good player and he played on a lot of hit records. Yeah, An another player that's kind of been, uh, been you know, somewhat yeah. forgotten. And he's still living. He's still around. He's, um, I saw him probably within the last six months, I guess. Uh, uh, I think he plays guitar mostly now, but uh, yeah. uh, he was a good player. You you mentioned Chips Moman and yes. Chips was another you know another you know guy that people don't people think of him mainly as a producer and maybe a songwriter, yes. but he played a lot of key guitar parts on on some he, of these records. He surely did, and that's that, that's why Rick was bringing Chips down. Uh, he needed an extra guitar player. You mentioned Terry Thompson. I didn't really work, work with Terry. I, I knew who he was, and uh, but he passed. Very at a very young age, and Rick was looking for guitar players to fill that vacuum that right. he, that he left, and uh, Chips was one of them, and uh, I think Tommy Cogbill was going to be the guitar player with Chips, yeah. but he, as soon as he started playing bass, forget the guitar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Reggie Young, and uh, he he indicated that he was also brought down here some to play on he sessions. He was. That's, yeah. I mean, that's how I met Reggie and. Reggie and I became great friends over the years. Uh, Reggie, when he would take a vacation, he'd come here just right. to hang out with my wife and I, I and his wife Jenny. Right. We liked, we enjoyed eating. <laughs> yes, I, I was. Uh, I was down at the uh, there's the the Marriott Hotel here in town that in the lounge has one of Reggie's guitars. One of his Telecasters is down yeah, there. And I haven't been in that in, in that bar in quite a while. I, yeah. When the pandemic hit, I quit going out, and right. I haven't really resumed my my yeah. nightly adventures. Yeah. You also played on on Reggie's, you know, one solo album that yes. he did, uh, that he cut down here. Yes, uh, we cut it at uh, uh, Alan Schulman uh, Mac McNally's house. Right. But uh, Alan Schulman was the I guess the producer on it, and uh, we cut it just not very far from here uh, at Mac's house. And uh, it was a really uh, low-key session, you know. I mean, yeah. there wasn't any kind of big recording session, but it was, uh, I loved working with Reggie and Alan and Mac, all of them. Yeah, because Mac's been a, a, a big supporter of the area and he's kind of... He, he sure has. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the, uh, you know, some of the guitar players that uh, that that you worked with, uh, because it seemed like there was kind of a, there was kind of like the core Swampers that came in, and then it seemed like there was this kind of second guitar chair that was kind of always rotating. It was around. rotating, yeah. The, yeah. the rhythm session was Jimmy on rhythm and guitar, and Spooner at first on keys, and then later Barry, yeah, and Roger of course on everything, drums, and and, and me, but we didn't have a full-time lead guitarist. And uh, Eddie Hinton was the first one when we started working down here. And um, Marlon Green was our first uh, engineer here mm -hmm. in the studio, but he was also a really good guitar player. And uh, who, we asked, who else could we say? Well, Eddie Hinton, who yeah. I worked with a lot, but Eddie, through Eddie, I met Dwayne. Yeah. And we started doing sessions where, where it was Eddie and Dwayne, or Eddie and uh, and Jimmy, or it, Jimmy, Eddie, and Dwayne. You know, it was a, a mixture of the three guitar players. Yeah. 
What was Eddie's specialty as a guitarist? Gosh, he could do it. He, he was a, just a great musician. He could sing, he could play, he could write songs. Uh, he, he could be a, the, easily the leader on a session as far as ideas, coming up with ideas. He was really good at that. Uh, I think that he picked up playing the slide guitar from seeing Dwayne pick it up and do it because neither one of them had ever really played that yeah. much, but they they learned quickly, I think. Yeah. And those those sessions were were over at Fame. That were I guess some of them were done over at Fame with yeah, with, and, uh, and with Quinn Ivy yeah. down at History, yeah. uh, Percy Sledge, and yeah. some of the other artists. So when when you when you all banded together and and came out here with the help of of Jerry uh, Wexler, uh, so Junior Low he decided not to go with. And he didn't want to come with us because he yeah. would he'd be leaving leaving a sure thing over right. at Fame, yeah. and uh, we were ready to. Make, make the change, and uh, you know, luckily it worked out. Yeah, and there was a there was a little bit of a lull there before things started taking off. Yeah, it, there was, but it, there's always always is. You know, you think yeah. a little bit of a lull, but it's a matter of weeks, really. Yeah, and and also you know, getting a studio set up. And yeah, and this was already a studio. Uh, a guy named Fred Beavis built a studio for his son to operate it, and his son really didn't know what to do with it, and so Fred offered it to, to Jimmy. And Jimmy pulled Roger in, and then me and Barry. And uh, I remember coming down here and nailing burlap on the walls and stuff like that, and thinking, "Gosh, I hope we've made the right, the right move." But we, we luckily, Jerry was in our corner, Jerry Wexler, and he brought Cher. I mean, I did. I would never have thought our first artist would be Cher, but right. it was Cher and uh, Boz Skaggs, who I didn't know from before. Boss came to fame and checked us out, posing as a reporter for Rolling Stone magazine. He and Jan Winter came down here, <laughs> uh, Jan being the publisher of Rolling right. Stone, and uh, he came and checked us out at fame, and then later he shows up here, and I thought, well, I thought you were a writer. And he said, well, I'm, I am a writer, but yeah. I'm also a singer and songwriter. And that was a great album that he did. It wasn't a hit, but that, right. that first Boss Skaggs album, it was really great. And I guess probably the thing that everybody knows about it was the, uh, Dwayne Dwayne Allman playing on uh, whatever the song that was. <laughs> I think is it "Loan Me a Dime." Line, "Loan Me a Dime." Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, a friend gave gave me a, a original pressing of that album uh, for my birthday, and uh, it's a it's a it's a great cut, great album. <laughs> And at that time, I don't think Roger or I or anybody really knew that much about playing the blues. And yeah. that was probably the first time I ever played anything that was kind of blues oriented. Right. And I was just faking it. And I yeah. think we all probably all were. Yeah, because you would you would listen more to R and B, and that's what you would cut yeah. cut your teeth more in the in the R and B world. It seems like things somewhat shifted. You know, well. In the interview I did with uh, Reggie Young, he he felt like, and of course he was in Memphis, but he felt like when uh, when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, that it kind of killed off R and B music for white musicians it, it to play did. for a while. It did, and uh, I guess that was the the good thing about Jerry bringing Cher and and Boss and some of the other artists we worked with. Uh, he he could see the the writing on the wall, so to speak. Yeah. It was getting where the the black artists were not wanting to be with white musicians. That changed though. And, right. And, uh, but at first, I think everybody was a little nervous. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Ha having somebody like Martin Luther King be as assassinated. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. But then things things did turn around and you started doing, you know, more and more R&B and it kind of, uh, of course the, the Staples, that was such a, a, a huge, you know, record. And uh, so, how aware of you were of the staples of Mavis and Not the Staples? Not very much at all. I, okay. knew, I, I heard of them. Yeah. I, mean, I knew they were a gospel family band. I knew their daddy was, was Daddy and Yvonne and Cleotha, uh, Mavis' sisters. Yeah. And it, their brother Purvis at one time had been with them, but he was no longer with them by the, by the time they came down here. I think the first time I worked with Mavis, it was a thing that Mavis and maybe Johnny Taylor did together, a sort of a, a duets album, and I don't know if that's even around anymore, yeah. but as uh, uh, soon as we heard Mavis, we thought, wow, yeah. 
Yeah. And it, it affect all, all of us. Eddie Hinton could do a perfect Mavis. I mean, he could sing like Mavis. I, I thought, <laughs> wow. And Eddie, Eddie was part of that group that played on uh, I'll Take You There. Yes. Yeah. And as we, we, uh, we kind of mentioned this earlier, in that uh, the, the song was, was kind of mainly just a, a groove. Right. Yeah, and and y'all were played an acetate or like some other demo we of played, a song. He played us the Liquidator by the Harry J All Stars, which was a Jamaican group. Yeah, and he brought he'd been on vacation. Al had been on vacation in Jamaica and heard that and brought it and played it. And he said, "I want to do something like this, but not exactly the same thing." The intro, the da da, yeah. is exactly the same thing. But right. the the rest of the song, it, it just. One to four, one to four, one. Yeah. And uh, what we did is we experimented amongst ourselves with the bass line and the pattern that, that we did till we found something that you could play over and over and over and over and over. Wow. And buddy, I have. <laughs> yeah. So how many times do you think you, you went Good through? Lord. How long did it take you to get the, get the, the patterns down for the song? Not long. We've yeah. never taken long. I mean, right. I mean the, the, what you hear on most of the records we've done is usually a first or second take. Yeah. And what we do is we do that and then we fix if there's a mistake or, or something that can be fixed. I think most of the records we've done have been, have been first or second takes. Was, Rick was the one who would take, take all these hundreds of cuts and I think he was still just unsure because he's, he's definitely a talented producer. He just, I think, was unsure when he knew when he had it. Yeah. In Mavis Staples' biography, she talks about "I'll Take You There," saying that she, you know, kind of wrote part of it, and then when the song came out, it, the, Al Bell was the only one given uh, right. writer writer credit. And just think how much money she would have made. Yeah, which that kind of brings up a question in that uh, the business side of things. So y'all were around the Swampers. You and the Swampers were around some pretty savvy businessmen at different times, and. And uh, I'm sure that you know, like Jerry and like Al Bell and all these guys, Tom what, Dow, yeah, Tom Dow, Arif Mardin. Yeah. You know. So, what were you, what were you learning from them, like business-wise? I don't know if we ever learned anything business-wise. Yeah. We, you know, our first experience with a quote record producer was Rick, and yeah. then later on, some of the other people that would come in and record yeah. with Rick and and Quinn Ivy. I can't neglect Quinn. Uh, but I'd never really worked with a real producer until we were around Wexler and Tom Dowd and those guys. And um, we, we all of a sudden said, oh, so that's what a producer does. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems like y'all did learn about publishing and things like that and songwriters. And it didn't, didn't y'all start your own publishing companies? And, yes. And Jimmy had operated uh, Rick Hall's publishing over at Fame. And so he had all the experience with publishing companies and he saw soon that that was really where the money was. And so as soon as we came over here and started our, our own business, that was the first thing he did was start yeah. our publishing company. And uh, at first we had a partner uh, who was in, I was in a band with, a guy named Terry Woodford, and we, we made him a full partner just to run our publishing company, but it didn't really work out. So we had to... It yeah. cost us, but we had to uh, buy him out. But uh, uh, Jimmy was always really savvy about the need for a publishing company and what it, what, you know, it could, it pays for the studio. Really. Right. Were you, were you glad that y'all were involved in publishing? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Without a doubt. Yes. Yeah. Has that been an, an important uh, aspect of? Well, I, I regret that I sold, I mean, we all sold our publishing company uh, to Malico, who's from Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, I re regret it. I, at the time, I thought, hey, I'll sell this, you know, it'd be good. Yeah. You know, publishing companies keep paying for themselves over and over and over, and I'm, right. I was too dumb to know. It's continuing to gener generate money. Yeah. So, uh, what? Again, that's just interesting, you know, being here in, in your spot and seeing, you know, seeing this old, you know, Fender Basement head and, and, a, and a blonde 212 cab. So this was your, this was your, kind of your rig. Yes, in the studio. I've, I've got somewhere a speaker that goes with this head, but uh, I had 
been playing bass through a Fender concert amp. Mm -hmm. You know, the first basements were four, four okay. ten inch speakers, and uh, I, I I played through a concert amp and used this as an extension speaker, thinking, well, this will make the bass better. I've since learned you need a lot of power, and this is sixty watts, I think. Uh, but it's perfect for the studio. Yeah. It's just when I'm playing live, you need something, you need a monster. <laughs> right, to have all the clean headroom. So was this amp mic'd up when you recorded? I'm trying to remember. I know the mic at uh, over at Thang, uh, Rick had a, I think it was an RCA 44, one of those, just like right. Johnny Carson's mic. Yes. We had one of those, and uh, he mic'd that, and I think that's where I, the first direct box I saw. I, I think I said earlier that Jimmy's uncle, Dexter Johnson, was a guy who liked to work on amps and things, and he could fix anything, but he made our first direct boxes. And uh, I, I don't think I ever saw a commercial direct box till later on, but the first ones we had were made by Dexter. Yeah. So, so at some point you, you might have mic'd this, but also gone direct? Yes. Okay. And then I, I see your old tuner here. Yeah, and I've, yeah. I've, I've had that forever. Yeah. It's probably the first one in town. No, I, I take that back. The band, I play, the high school band, they had one. And what, being the fuck ups that we were, we'd walk out of the studio, uh, out of the whatever band room, and we'd turn that knob to get it where it would not be true. Right. Just to, just to mess, mess with the band director. Who was coming in next. <laughs> yeah. And you, you had mentioned earlier about your, your 61 jazz bass. And yes, uh, I bought a jazz bass first, I think, the first bass in town, and it was stolen in uh, 1972 on a traffic tour. Right. And uh, I, after, I went to, after that, I went to Manny's and I bought two more. This must have been like 72, and uh, the early 70s, Jazz basses were horrible compared to the earlier jazz basses. What, what was horrible about it? They just, I don't know, they didn't sound good, they didn't okay. play good, they just, yeah. they, they were terrible. Yeah. But I, 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 the ones, I had two exactly like, they were black with uh, the maple neck and the black yeah. blocks on the maple neck. And I don't know how it happened, but I had two exactly like that I bought at Manny's. And between those two basses, I played a lot of big records with those basses, even though I didn't like them that much. Did you use flats or round wound? Whatever came on basses back yeah. then. I've tried to remember. Uh, I'm using flats now uh, uh, most of the time. Uh, but whatever used to come on basses when you bought them was what I had. Yeah, and so and you would change strings only if one broke. Oh probably. yeah, yeah, yeah. Why why I mean, change it? Yeah, and, and yeah. gosh. To me, they were very expensive, like sixteen bucks for. <laughs> right. <laughs> I said. Right. And you you mentioned you know traffic, and so that was the first tour that you ever did. Yes. So what w did you enjoy being on tour, or did it just make you realize that you had made the right decision in being a studio uh, guy? I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed traveling. I'd never traveled that much, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the people that you played for, and I enjoyed the group. But I was when, by the time we finished that first tour, I think that was like five weeks or something. I, I was ready to come back home, but and get back in the studio. But uh, every now and then, I do enjoy going out and playing. Uh, I I much prefer the studio though. Yeah, it's just easier on your body. Yes. David, tell me about getting to play with Mavis again because that's someone that, of course, you you cut you know records with in the seventies. And then all of a sudden, in the last decade or so, you've played with her off and on, and then recently you played a couple of shows with yeah, her. Yeah, we played, uh, well, the most recent show was uh, at the Orion Amphitheater in Huntsville, which is a fabulous uh, facility. It's big, I guess it holds about 6,000 people. I don't know, it's beautiful open air, but it's it's just probably one of the nicest amphitheaters I've, I've ever been in. Uh, that was very recently, we played with um, Mavis and Rick Holstrom, her guitar player, and the drummer's name, I can't remember his name, I'm, I'm right. terrible, but I, uh, her drummer, and, yeah. and uh, it was just me, Mavis, Rick, and the drummer. Yeah. So just that very simple. And uh, she's great. I've, I've gotten to work with her a few times 
in the last few years, uh, and uh, I, it's just like we click. Yeah. We, we walk in, see each other, and, and start smiling. Yeah. And, uh, and she's, but, she's such a warm, wonderful person and such a great singer, and all she has to do is just open her mouth, and she's yeah. Mavis Staples. Yeah. It's 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 kind of amazing. It's yes. she's so much you know uh, the the phrase larger than life really yeah. you know. Did you play the whole show with them or was it just sitting in? Mm. You know what the I don't remember the whole show I guess you know it wasn't like it wasn't like a concert yeah. it was like a few songs yeah but oh. uh, Rick and I. Yeah, Rick and I uh, had talked on the phone, and he, he said, what, I, I think we played six songs. Yeah. And uh, two I didn't know at all. And then one of them was, I'll Take You There, and they dropped it a half step. <laughs> and a half step is harder than five steps. I mean, it's just, yes. it's so weird, just a half step. Was your hand wants to go to the place where it always went. And uh, Respect Yourself. Yeah. I've forgotten what the other songs were, but... Uh, it was like five or six songs. Yeah. And Rick is so good. I mean, he can cover yeah. any mistakes that you might make. What, he told me that, the, you know, they, there was really a conscious effort to kind of be a throwback to more of the sound of uh, of, of pops, of, you know, of him and yeah. the band and the smaller combo and, instead of the big sound. Yeah, and you yeah. know, when we work with the Staples Singers, pops never play. Yeah. And that's the craziest thing because in the studio you would say, well, play like Steve Cropper or play like Chuck Berry or play like Pop Staples. Yeah. I mean, he was one of the people that we would try to yeah. emulate, but he never played on any of our recording sessions. Uh, I, think, yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. I do know why. It was Al Bell's decision. He didn't. He wanted to make it more modern than yeah. the traditional sound that Pops would get, because he's a traditional yeah. gospel player. But boy, we loved his playing. Yeah, a, a shrewd decision that 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 paid off, but also it it kind of robbed people of 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 hearing Pops unless they listened to the older records. Yeah, yeah. But he he had a definite influence on the on the group with his vocals and stuff. I think Al just, he thought he would, he, he, it was old school for Pops to play, but I, I, I disagree with him on that. Right. Your son, uh, uh, Patterson, and the Drive-By Truckers, you've, you've played with them off and on some, too, also. I have, and I enjoy it. They're, they're loud. <laughs> <laughs> they're probably one of the loudest bands I've ever played with. And uh, having worked in the studio so much, you know, we have a way we learn songs and work them out and everything. Rock and roll bands don't do that. They just bash it out until yeah. they, they get it. And uh, we've, we've always worked things out, the chord charts and things yeah. like that, uh, and got it you know, in our heads. Uh, and really would work them out pretty good. It don't take us long, but it would, we would have them worked out. And rock and roll bands, they just bash until they yeah. come up with something. And uh, I, I get a little imp impatient with that, but I have fun working with my son. Yeah. Yes, and, and and as far it seemed like you you would cut stuff at lower volumes. You're not, and, and even when he played live, you would probably wouldn't want to play at deafening volume. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you know, you don't want him louder anything louder than a some drums or or words or piano, and uh, and those are the best sounds in, in the studio. Uh, when you crank things up too much in the studio, it's just not really good. Yeah. It's a sound a sign of an amateur when people overplay in a studio. Who who taught you to not overplay? Well, I, I learned working with Rick Hall and uh, Quinn Ivey were the first people I worked with. They were producers, but uh, I don't know. There was just a tradition of session players but before I came along. Uh, uh, Junior Low and uh, gosh, just in the studio you don't you don't play as loud or you don't you don't need to you know it, uh, it makes everything distort. I remember when Dwayne first came to Dwayne Allman first came to fame, he came in with a Fender Twin amp, two 12 inch speakers, and would turn it up to 13 or something, and he he can't do that. Yeah, I mean the amps that I see guys use now are these little bitty champs or. or small eight yeah. to ten inch speakers mm -hmm. you just don't have to be that loud and 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 you can you can make it sound like it's loud with a small lamp yeah. 
course, you know, all these sessions with like Paul Simon, I think it was it was funny in that I think in one of the interviews you said that, uh, you know, Paul Simon enjoyed working with you until he found out that y'all couldn't read music. I don't know. I don't remember saying that. Okay. Uh, I think he knew that we couldn't read music. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know if some of the other people he worked with read music that much. Uh, right. Uh, he liked he liked the idea that we would work it out in the studio, yeah. and you don't really when you're doing it like that you don't really have to read anything. You're right. making up your parts. Yeah, you're just you're just uh, you're learning what what he's played for you as a as as kind of a, a live demo. Yeah, we would learn it together, and and I, I would working with Paul for instance. I'd listen to his his hand, his his right and left hands, what they were what he was doing on the guitar and base my parts on that and try not to conflict with what he's doing because that's a big part of Paul Simon is his, his guitar playing. And, and and like I said, Dwayne would come in and turn up and just Rick Hall would have a fit and try to get him turned down. I think Dwayne soon learned that, that, that you know, he, he didn't really have a very long career as a studio musician, but he didn't have to because he was all right. my brothers. Right. He found out that that wasn't what he wanted right. to be. He thought it was. Yeah, yeah I think so. He uh, he came to Muscle Shows. Uh, he'd been in, out in California working with uh, uh, his brother, <laughs> and they saw that they weren't really doing very good out there, and so Dwayne came, was coming back and came through Muscle Shows because he knew Eddie Hinton was here, and uh, he thought, well, I'll see if I can't make it as a studio player. And Dwayne was a great player. He just wasn't cut out to do the studio thing. He didn't He didn't want to do a three-hour session. He wanted to come in and cut it and go eat or something. <laughs> yeah. The bass solo on I'll Take You There, how did that come about? You know, just, you know, it's, what is it, eight bars? It's yeah. real short. It's just, it, it was what fit in that era. era area and uh, I don't really know I think we just worked it out in yeah. the studio I mean nobody said hey do this or do that we just we experimented we hit on something that was the right length of time yeah. uh, we always have worked within the limits of like a three minute record and yeah. until I started working with traffic I never thought anybody would play longer than three minutes yeah <laughs> So in the in the arc of kind of Muscle Shoals, things kind of change in the in the late seventies and into the early nineteen eighties. There becomes a period where there's more country music kind of been. It seemed like country artists were coming down here for a while to yeah. cut stuff, and then things kind of uh, they slowed down to a degree in the in the eighties somewhat. Yeah, I started. It's funny. I, I started playing more live gigs during that time. I was playing with a group called the Decoys. And they were, a, I'd, I'd heard them play, and I, and I thought, man, I like that band. And so they said, well, come, our, our bass player's yeah. going to go out of town for a couple of weeks. Come and sit in with us for a couple of weeks. So I, I made chord charts on every song they did, and I walked in with my chord charts, and the drummer laughed at me. And then when he got through, when we finished the date, he said, well, you did it. Yeah. I, I, I learned quickly, and uh, I, I, I learned that they did the thing, the, their set, the same way every time, and so all I had to do was learn the songs. Yeah, and then you and, can uh, you can step in. Were you ever tempted, like, you're the 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 class before you, like Norbert and and uh, David Briggs and those guys? Of course, they all moved to Nashville. Were you ever tempted to move to Nashville? Even Barry moved to Nashville. Yeah, I wasn't. But I, it never appealed to me. I think we probably talked about it, but it just it never really appealed to me. And we had such a good thing going here. Wow. Yeah. So how did you feel when Barry left? I think he was looking for. I don't know. I, I don't. You know, I'm, I'm still kind of wonder that. I, um, by the time he left, we were working with Clayton Ivey and um, Randy McCormick and some other keyboard players, and I think Barry was wanting to move into production. Mm -hmm. He had been co-producing albums with uh, Jerry Wexler, and I think he was wanting to start a career as a producer. And he, I didn't, he didn't say anything to us, but when he moved to Nashville, he kind of wanted to disassociate himself from the Muscle Shoals rhythm section. Wow! And uh, at, at first, it kind of occurred hurt my feelings a little bit, but right. I thought, well, we're, we're doing fine without him. Yeah. Uh, and he was wanting to be a producer, really. I think that was his ultimate goal, was to produce records and not just to be the keyboard player. Yeah. Wow, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Because Barry was such a, you know, one, one, one of the guys. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think he got tired of being one of the guys. Yeah. And you know, before Barry, it was Spooner, and Spooner's still around, and uh, like I said, Clayton Ivey and Randy McCormick, there's been several really good keyboard players. We've always needed a great, strong keyboard player, just like we've always needed lead guitar players. Yeah. Uh, and we've had some good ones. Yeah. Pete Carr, we haven't mentioned him, but Pete right. Carr is a, one of the most amazing players. He could play anything. He was really yeah. uh, versatile. And, and he passed away a couple a couple years yes, ago. Yes, he now. did. Uh, yeah. I don't know the exact date, but uh, Pete was such a great, versatile player, and uh, just a really nice guy. Yeah, like Main Street and so many of the, yeah. so many of those tunes that he played. Uh, Tonight's the night with uh, Rod Stewart. Rod Stewart. Yeah, played some some fantastic uh, solos. How? How how was there so much talent in in this area? I know you've probably been asked that question a million times, but it's just like, how did so many people? Was it just that that talent is everywhere and and, and it needs to just no, be I, brought I, up, or I, did something know, special happen? I I don't know. I can't explain it, but there does seem to be a lot. But I think I was influenced by Norbert Norbert and. Uh, Jerry Kerrigan and some of those guys, and they they kind of set a standard for the ones who came along afterward. Uh, and it's just tradition, I think, uh, that uh, we all live up to. <laughs> yeah. We have these standards we have to meet for ourselves. Yeah. The, the Muscle Shoals documentary, of course, really changed things in, in a huge way in the area and brought a lot more interest and and just knowledge of the the importance of this studio and fame. Yeah, I don't think people ever really knew. We never really tried to advertise or make yeah. ourselves known that much. And and so when the documentary came back came out, people who lived here in town thought, "What? I didn't know they did that." Yeah. I mean, it's uh because we never really promoted ourselves or advertised what we did that much. Uh and and then, and I think it was a what moment for a lot of people when they saw the documentary. How much did it mean to you to feel like you were appreciated by your your people? <laughs> uh, I, I, you always want to want approval. Yeah. I've never really needed to have uh, applause or admiration or anything like that. But you want your peers at least to approve you and uh, yeah. approve of you. And I love now that my neighbors and my friends know what we do because like I said for a long time nobody knew what we were even doing here yeah uh, people would drive by on the street this Jackson Highway is a, is a busy street and we were spent nine years I guess here before we moved to the location down the river and people would drive by and see the cars in the parking lot and they think gosh I wonder if there's they're having a dance there or, yeah. they, or if they're gambling they, they didn't really know what we were doing uh, I, I'm very proud, though, of what we've done, what we have done. Uh, I'm proud of the body of work. I'm looking at that Lulu there. Uh, we were all so young, too. That, yeah. that, that's something that I always I think about now. Hell, I'm an old guy now, but I think, gosh, I was doing that stuff when I was 26 years old. And uh, it's uh, I'm very proud of it. Yeah. And we were all the same age uh, here at the studio, Barry and Jimmy were had the same birthday, and I was, I guess, a little bit less than a year uh, younger than them, and Roger was a couple years younger than me, but we were about the same age. We had the same interests. We'd, uh, when we'd have a successful session, we'd treat ourselves to going out to dinner together. I mean, no yeah. big time stuff, just going, to, going yeah. to George's or somewhere and having a dinner. Yeah. What is one of the tunes that y'all cut that still it, it kind of puts a smile on your face and makes you happy when you hear it? Well, Staple Singers obviously is one of my favorites. I, I, I like I'll Take You There. I love Respect Yourself. Yeah. But there's some other things that are really good and, I, and my wife and I'll be driving in the car and have the Soul Channel on or something and I say, that's me. And she's like, yeah, I know it's you. <laughs> you know, she gets tired of me doing it, but I'm yeah. really proud of what we've done. I think the, the the records sound really good. We we took a lot of pride in our playing, but also the sound here at the studio. Yes. Jimmy was a sound engineer as well as a guitar player, and we took a lot of pride in all that. And I'm very proud of it to this day. Yeah. 
Well, David, I'm so honored. Thank you for uh, letting us interview. Thank you for sitting down. Thank you for letting us into the studio. It sure. was a, a real honor and a pleasure. All right. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. My pleasure. Yes. Mm -hmm.